Section twenty nine, part four of Chapter seven of the Commentaries of the Laws of England, Book one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone, Book one, Chapter seven, part four. The king is likewise the fountain of honour, of office, and of privilege, and this is in a different sense from that wherein he is styled the fountain of justice, for here he is really the parent of them. It is impossible that government can be maintained without a due subordination of rank, that the people may know and distinguish such as are set over them, in order to yield them their due respect and obedience, and also that the officers themselves, being encouraged by emulation and the hopes of superiority, may the better discharge their functions. And the law supposes that no one can be so good a judge of their several merits and services as the king himself who employs them. It has, therefore, entrusted him the sole power of conferring dignitaries and honours, in confidence that he will bestow them upon none but such as deserve them. And therefore all degrees of nobility, of knighthood, and other titles, are received by immediate grant from the crown, either expressed in writing, by writs or letters patent, as in the creation of peers and baronets, or by a corporeal investiture, as in the creation of a simple knight. From the same principle also arises the prerogative of erecting and disposing of offices, for honours and offices are in their nature convertible and synonymous. All officers under the crown carry in the eye of the law an honour along with them, because they imply a superiority of parts and abilities, being supposed to be always filled with those that are most able to execute them. And on the other hand, all honours in their original had duties or offices annexed to them. An earl was the conservator or governor of a county, and a knight was bound to attend the king in his wars. For the same reason, therefore, that honours are in the disposal of the king, offices ought to be likewise. And as the king may create new titles, so he may create new offices, but with this restriction, that he cannot create new offices with new fees annexed to them, nor annex new fees to old offices, for this would be a tax upon the subject which cannot be imposed but by act of Parliament. Wherefore, in 13th Henry the Fourth, a new office being created by the King's Letters Patent for measuring cloths, with a new fee for the same, the Letters Patent were, on account of the new fee, revoked and declared void in Parliament. Upon the same, or a like reason, the King has also the prerogative of conferring privileges upon private persons, such as granting place or precedence to any of his subjects, as shall seem good to his royal wisdom, or such as converting aliens, or persons born out of the king's dominions, into denizens, whereby some very considerable privileges of natural-born subjects are conferred upon them. Such also is the prerogative of erecting corporations, whereby a number of private persons are united and knit together, and enjoy many liberties, powers, and immunities in their politic capacity, which they were utterly incapable of in their natural of aliens, denizens, natural-born and naturalized subjects, I shall speak more largely in a subsequent chapter, as also of corporations at the close of this book of our commentaries. I now only mention them incidentally, in order to remark the king's prerogative of making them, which is grounded upon this foundation, that the king, having the sole administration of the government in his hands, is the best and the only judge, in what capacities, with what privileges, and under what distinctions his people are the best qualified to serve, and to act under him. A principle, which was carried so far by the imperial law, that it was determined to be the crime of sacrilege, even to doubt whether the prince had appointed proper officers in the state. Another light in which the laws of England consider the king with regard to domestic concerns, is as the arbiter of commerce. By commerce I at present mean domestic commerce only. It would lead me into too large a field, if I were to attempt, to enter upon the nature of foreign trade, its privileges, regulations, and restrictions, and would also be quite beside the purpose of these commentaries, which are confined to the laws of England. Whereas no municipal laws can be sufficient to order and determine the very extensive and complicated affairs of traffic and merchandise, neither can they have a proper authority for this purpose. For as these are transactions carried on between the subject of independent states, the municipal laws of one will not be regarded by the other. 
for which reason the affairs of commerce are regulated by a law of their own, called the law merchant, or lex mercatoria, which all nations agree in and take notice of. And in particular the law of England does in many cases refer itself to it, and leaves the causes of merchants to be tried by their own peculiar customs, and that often, even in matters relating to inland trade, as, for instance, with regard to the drawing, the acceptance, and the transfer of bills of exchange. With us in England, the king's prerogative, so far as it relates to mere domestic commerce, will fall principally under the following articles. First, the establishment of public marts, or places of buying and selling, such as markets and fairs, with the tolls thereunto belonging. These can only be set up by virtue of the king's grant, or by long and immemorial usage and prescription, which presupposes such a grant. The limitation of these public resorts, to such time and place as may be most convenient for the neighbourhood, forms a part of economics, or domestic polity, which, considering the kingdom as a large family, and the king as the master of it, he clearly has a right to dispose and order as he pleases. Secondly, the regulation of weights and measures. These, for the advantage of the public, ought to be universally the same throughout the kingdom, being the general criterion which reduce all things to the same or an equivalent value. But as weights and measures are things in their nature arbitrary and uncertain, it is therefore expedient that they be reduced to some fixed rule or standard, which standard it is impossible to fix by any written law or oral proclamation, for no man can, by words only, give another an adequate idea of a foot rule or a pound weight. It is therefore necessary to have recourse to some visible, palpable, material standard, by forming a comparison with which all weights and measures may be reduced to one uniform size, and the prerogative of fixing this standard, our ancient law vested in the crown, as in Normandy it belonged to the duke. This standard was originally kept at Winchester, and we find in the laws of King Edgar, near a century before the conquest, an injunction that the one measure, which was kept at Winchester, should be observed throughout the realm. Most nations have regulated the standard of measures of length by comparison with the parts of the human body, as the palm, the hand, the span, the foot, the cubit, the l, ulna or arm, the pace, and the fathom. But as these are of different dimensions and men of different proportions, our ancient historians inform us that a new standard of longitudinal measure was ascertained by King Henry I, who commanded that the ulna, or ancient L, which answers to the modern yard, should be made of the exact length of his own arm. And, one standard of measures of length being gained, all others are easily derived from thence, those of greater length by multiplying, those of less by subdividing that original standard. Thus, by the statute called Compositio ulnarum et perticarum, five yards and a half make a perch, and the yard is subdivided into three feet, and each foot into twelve inches, which inches will be each of the length of three grains of barley. Superficial measures are derived by squaring those of length, and measures of capacity by cubing them. The standard of weights was originally taken from corns of wheat, whence the lowest denominations of weights we have is still called a grain, thirty-two of which are directed, by the statute called Compositio Messerarum, to compose a pennyweight. Thereof, twenty make an ounce, twelve ounces a pound, and so upwards. And upon these principles the first standards were made, which, being originally so fixed by the crown, their subsequent regulations have been generally made by the king in Parliament. Thus, under King Richard I, in his Parliament held at Westminster, A.D. 1197, it was ordained that there shall be only one weight and one measure throughout the kingdom, and that the custody of the assize or standard of weights and measures shall be committed to a certain person in every city and borough, from whence the ancient office of the king's alnagar seems to have been derived, whose duty it was, for a certain fee, to measure all cloths made for sale, till the office was abolished by the statute 11 and 12, William the Third, c. 20. In King John's time this ordinance of King Richard was frequently dispensed with for money, which occasioned a provision to be made for enforcing it, in the great charters of King John and his son. These original standards were called Pondus Regis, and Mensura Domini Regis, and are directed by a variety of subsequent statutes to be kept in the exchequer, and all weights and measures to be made conformable thereto. 
But as Sir Edward Coke observes, though this hath so often by authority of Parliament been enacted, yet it could never be effected, so forcible is the custom with the multitude, when it hath gotten an ed. Thirdly, as money is the medium of commerce, it is the king's prerogative, as the arbiter of domestic commerce, to give it authority or make it current. Money is a universal medium, or common standard, by comparison with which the value of all merchandise may be ascertained, or it is a sign which represents the respective values of all commodities. Metals are well calculated for this sign, because they are durable and are capable of many subdivisions, and a precious metal is still better calculated for this purpose, because it is the most portable. A metal is also the most proper for a common measure, because it can be easily reduced to the same standard in all nations, and every particular nation fixes on its own impression, that the weight and standard, wherein consists the intrinsic value, may both be known by inspection only. As the quantity of precious metals increases, that is, the more of them there is extracted from the mine, this universal medium or common sign will sink in value and grow less precious. Above a thousand millions of bullion are calculated to have been imported into Europe from America within less than three centuries, and the quantity is daily increasing. The consequence is, that more money must be given now for the same commodity than was given a hundred years ago. And if any accident was to diminish the quantity of gold and silver, their value would proportionably rise. A horse, that was formerly worth ten pounds, is now perhaps worth twenty, and by any failure of current specie, the price may be reduced to what it was. Yet is the horse in reality neither dearer nor cheaper at one time than another, for if the metal which constitutes the coin was formerly twice as scarce as at present, the commodity was then as dear at half the price as it now is at the whole. The coining of money is in all states the act of the sovereign power, for the reason just mentioned, that its value may be known on inspection. And with respect to coinage in general, there are three things which must be considered therein, the materials, the impression, and the denomination. With regard to the materials, Sir Edward Coke lays it down that the money of England must be of either gold or silver, and none other was ever issued by the royal authority till 1672, when copper farthings and halfpence were coined by King Charles the Second, and ordered by proclamation to be current in all payments, under the value of sixpence, and not otherwise. But this copper coin is not upon the same footing with the other in many respects, particularly with regard to the offence of counterfeiting it. As to the impression, the stamping thereof is the unquestionable prerogative of the crown, for, though divers bishops and monasteries had formerly the privilege of coining money, yet, as Sir Matthew Hale observes, this was usually done by special grant from the king, or by prescription which supposes one, and therefore was derived from, and not in derogation of, the royal prerogative. Besides that they had only the profit of the coinage, and not the power of instituting either the impression or denomination, but had usually the stamp sent to them from the exchequer. The denomination, or the value for which coin is to pass current, is likewise in the breast of the king, and if any unusual pieces are coined, that value must be ascertained by proclamation. In order to fix the value, the weight and the fineness of the metal are to be taken into consideration together. When a given weight of gold or silver is of a given fineness, it is then of the true standard, and called sterling metal a name for which there are various reasons given, but none of them entirely satisfactory. And of this sterling metal all the coin of the kingdom must be made by the statute 25th Edward III, c. 13. So that the king's prerogative seemeth not to extend to the debasing or enhancing the value of the coin, below or above the sterling value, though Sir Matthew Hale appears to be of another opinion. The king may also, by his proclamation, legitimate foreign coin, and make it current here, declaring at what value it shall be taken in payments. But this, I apprehend, ought to be by comparison with the standard of our own coin, otherwise the consent of Parliament would be necessary. There is at present no such legitimated money, Portugal coin being only current by private consent, so that any one who pleases may refuse to take it in payment. The king may also at any time decry or cry down any coin of the kingdom, and make it no longer current. The king is, lastly, considered by the laws of England as the head and supreme governor of the national church. To enter into the reasons upon which this prerogative is founded is a matter rather of divinity than of law. 
I shall therefore only observe that by statute 26, Henry the Eighth, C. 1, reciting that the King's Majesty justly and rightfully is and ought to be the supreme head of the Church of England, and so had been recognized by the clergy of this kingdom in their convocation, it is enacted that the King shall be reputed the only supreme head in earth of the Church of England, and shall have, annexed to the imperial crown of this realm, as well as the titles and style thereof, as all jurisdictions, authorities, and commodities, to the said dignity of supreme head of the Church appertaining. And another statute to the same purport was made, First Elizabeth, C. 1. In virtue of this authority the king convenes, or prorogues, restrains, regulates, and dissolves all ecclesiastical synods or convocations. This was an inherent prerogative of the crown, long before the time of Henry the Eighth, as appears by the statute, 8 Henry the Sixth, C. 1, and the many authors, both lawyers and historians, vouched by Sir Edward Coke so that the statute 25th Henry the Eighth C. 19, which restrains the convocation from making or putting in execution any canons repugnant to the king's prerogative, or the laws, customs, and statutes of the realm, was merely declaratory of the old common law. That part of it only being new, which makes the king's royal assent actually necessary to the validity of every canon. The convocation or ecclesiastical synod in England differs considerably in its constitution from the synods of other Christian kingdoms, those consisting wholly of bishops, whereas with us the convocation is the miniature of a parliament, wherein the archbishop presides with regal state, the upper house of bishops represents the house of lords, and the lower house, composed of representatives of the several dioceses at large, and of each particular chapter therein, resembles the House of Commons with its knights of the shire and burgesses. This constitution is said to be owing to the policy of Edward I, who thereby at one and the same time let in the inferior clergy to the privilege of forming ecclesiastical canons, which before they had not, and also introduced a method of taxing ecclesiastical benefices by the consent of convocation. From this prerogative also of being the head of the church arises the king's right of nomination to vacant bishoprics, and certain other ecclesiastical preferments, which will be better considered when we come to treat of the clergy. I shall only here observe that this is now done in consequence of the statute 25th Henry the Eighth, C. 20. As head of the church, the king is likewise the dernier resort in all ecclesiastical causes, in appeal lying ultimately to him in chancery from the sentence of every ecclesiastical judge, which right was restored to the crown by the statute 25th Henry the Eighth, C. 19, as will more fully be shown hereafter. End of section 29.